On to Burkina Faso now. There's an interesting story of success from the auto sector there, specifically the release of a new electric vehicle produced by a local manufacturer. It's being hailed as an interesting move for a country that's been more synonymous with subsistence agriculture. Burkina Faso is manufacturing electric vehicles. These cars travel over 300 kilometers per charge, recharge in just 30 minutes, and are built entirely by African engineers using African materials. This is not a concept, it's real. And it changes everything. First, Africa is no longer just the world's mine, it's becoming a factory. Second, Elon Musk's Tesla, which heavily relies on African lithium and cobalt, now faces a continent choosing to use those minerals at home. Third, Africa's position as a cheap resource provider is under threat, because if Burkina Faso can build EVs, so can DR Congo, Zambia, or Namibia. This is more than just competition, it's a tectonic shift in global power. Africa, for decades, has been stuck in the same role, dig up the minerals, ship them abroad, and buy back the finished products at a price 10 times higher. Western corporations like Tesla have built entire business empires on this setup. A Tesla battery contains lithium from Zimbabwe, cobalt from Congo, graphite from Mozambique. But none of those countries own a single Tesla plant. None of them set the price. None of them reap the real profits. They mine the ground, but someone else owns the sky. Until now. Burkina Faso's breakthrough in EV manufacturing is not just symbolic, it's revolutionary because it proves that Africa no longer needs to export the raw, it can now refine, engineer, and build. This development shakes the very foundation of Tesla's empire. Elon Musk may have rockets, satellites, and global brand power, but his batteries still depend on the African Earth. And the African Earth is starting to speak. If countries begin diverting minerals to support local industries instead of foreign buyers, Tesla will face delays, shortages, and increased costs. It's not just about who builds the car, it's about who controls the minerals. And Musk doesn't. He negotiates with African governments, but now those governments are investing in their own engineers. They're building assembly plants, research labs, and charging networks. They're no longer begging for technology transfer, they're creating it. And it's not only Burkina Faso. Rwanda is already producing its own electric motorcycles. Uganda has developed the Kyra EV. Nigeria is experimenting with solar-powered vehicles. Ghana is working on electric buses. These aren't prototypes hidden in labs, they're vehicles on African roads. They're moving people. They're creating jobs. They're changing how children grow up thinking about science, technology, and Africa's place in the world. Because for so long, Africans were told they couldn't do it themselves. That manufacturing was too complex. That innovation only came from Silicon Valley, Germany, or Japan. But the truth was always different. The truth is, Africa was never poor in intelligence. It was only robbed of opportunity. Burkina Faso's EV doesn't just drive on electricity, it runs on defiance. In a country that's been targeted by sanctions, destabilized by terrorism, and vilified for rejecting Western dominance, the fact that it can produce an electric vehicle sends a message louder than any political speech. It says, we can do it ourselves. And that terrifies those who have profited from African dependency. Because now, the mineral deals will come with new terms. Now, China and the US will have to compete not just with each other, but with the continent itself. Tesla's supply chain doesn't just risk becoming more expensive, it risks becoming obsolete. Imagine a future where Africa refuses to sell raw cobalt unless it's processed locally. Imagine a future where Zimbabwe sells lithium batteries instead of lithium ore. Where DR Congo, the heart of the world's cobalt supply, becomes the world's battery factory. In that future, Tesla won't be the undisputed king of electric vehicles. It will be one brand among many, forced to partner, license, and share technology. And Elon Musk, for all his ambition, will have to bow not to Wall Street, but to the African Union. Because if Africa stops being a warehouse for raw resources and becomes a hub for finished products, the global map of economic power will be redrawn. Europe's manufacturing dominance will fade. America's tech monopoly will crack. 
and Asia's factories will have to make room. Burkina Faso didn't just build a car. It lit a signal fire. And now other nations are watching closely. If one of the world's poorest, most war-torn countries can do it, what's stopping the rest? And this shift is about more than EVs. It's about the right to development. For decades, the West used climate change as both a reason and an excuse to control Africa's industrial pace. You can pollute like we did, they said. You need green energy. But when Africa asks for fair trade, for access to green tech, for inclusion in global markets, it is told to wait. Well, Burkina Faso didn't wait. It didn't ask for permission. It built a vehicle that respects the climate, empowers the people, and disrupts the global order. That disruption is already being felt. Multinational corporations are realizing that their once guaranteed access to Africa's resources is no longer so secure. Investors are watching. Governments are scrambling to reassess their partnerships. What happens if Ghana builds its own electric tractors? What happens if Kenya produces its own solar EVs and sells them across East Africa? What happens when Algeria, with its vast phosphate reserves, begins making battery cells for the entire Maghreb? Tesla's dream of global dominance begins to blur. Because what Elon Musk didn't plan for was an Africa that says no. No to export-only contracts. No to unfair pricing. No to being left out of the future. And yes, to building it instead. A future where electric cars don't just arrive in shipping containers from Shanghai or San Francisco, but roll out of workshops in Ouagadougou, powered by African innovation and pride. So, let's be honest, Burkina Faso's EV won't kill Tesla. Not today. Not tomorrow. But it has done something more powerful. It has made Tesla bleed. And in the world of business, when a giant bleeds, it attracts challenges. More EV startups will rise across the continent. More governments will fund local engineers. More students will dream beyond borders. And slowly, the monopoly cracks. Because this ISNT about one car in one country. This is about a new identity for Africa, an industrial identity. An independent one. The kind of Africa that doesn't just supply the future, but builds it. And if Elon Musk wants to survive in that future, he will have to do something he's never done before, a play fair. But even deeper than technology or business lies the cultural shift this triggers. For centuries, Africans were shown only Western success and African struggle. But now, African children will grow up riding African-made EVs, knowing their uncles built them, knowing their towns have factories, not just farms. That changes imagination. That changes confidence. It makes innovation part of the identity, not the exception. And with that cultural shift comes policy change. African leaders, especially those rising through revolutionary movements like in Burkina Faso, are no longer satisfied with being resource managers. They want to be industrial architects. That means reshaping trade laws, enforcing local manufacturing quotas, and investing in education that supports engineering and automation. Musk is not just facing competition from engineers, he's facing resistance from presidents. In fact, what's happening could become the biggest story of the next decade, a silent but unstoppable industrial revolution in Africa, not funded by IMF loans or dictated by colonial contracts, but by Africans for Africans. And in this new chapter, companies like Tesla can either become partners or be replaced. Because the minerals no longer move one way. The power no longer flows in one direction. The world is tilting, and Africa is rising. And if Tesla still believes it can simply set up shop in Africa, extract what it needs, and leave, it will be shocked. Because Africans are now asking hard questions. Who owns the technology? Who trains the workers? Who profits from the patents? Who builds the battery recycling plants? Who controls the data from smart cars? These are no longer technical questions, they are questions of sovereignty. And so, Elon Musk must decide, will he continue to treat Africa as a supplier or evolve and treat it as a partner? Because what's coming out of Burkina Faso is not just a car, it's a warning shot. The age of extraction is ending. 
the age of African engineering has begun. And for those who ignore it, the price will be more than just competition. It will be irrelevance.